Boa noite a todos e todas. Good evening, everyone who's watching us. I would just give some instructions in Portuguese, and then we'll turn to English. Pessoal, essa sessão está sendo traduzida, vai ser totalmente em inglês, e a gente tem tradutores, então quem precisar, corre lá, né, se já não estiver. É, essa é mais uma sessão do CODA BR 2022, a sétima edição da Conferência Brasileira de Jornalismo de Dados e Métodos Digitais. É, estamos muito felizes de fazer essa sessão e marcar essa data de 50 anos do jornalismo de precisão. E quem vai conduzir essa sessão é o Marcelo Soares, que é um jornalista de dados, um dos pioneiros do jornalismo de dados no Brasil, e um grande entusiasta, assim, grande mesmo, assim, gente, é um entusiasta mesmo do trabalho do Philip Mayer, grande conhecedor também. Vocês vão ver que ele mobilizou depoimentos é, de grandes nomes do jornalismo internacional e trouxe né, como convidada a filha do Philip Mayer, que o, o Philip Mayer vai estar assistindo a sessão, por isso que a gente vai fazer totalmente em inglês. Né, ele está lá na, na casa dele, <coughs> se recuperando. É, então, a gente está muito contente de fazer essa sessão é, aproveitem, né? vai ter a parte de perguntas também, vai ser uma conversa entre os dois. Então, gostaria de chamar aqui, para iniciar essa sessão, o Marcelo Soares. Muito obrigado, pessoal. Eu vou aqui fazer a... Já começa em inglês? Ok. Good evening, everyone. Uh... Uh, it's an honor to be here to to make this homage to to one of my heroes, the, the the man who inspired me when I first found his book when I was 19. That was a long time ago. That was last century. Uh, and uh, let me introduce you, my dear friend Melissa Meyer, his daughter, who's here representing the family. Phil, hope you're watching this. Hello, and thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's turn off the lights and see the video. If you are a journalist or thinking of becoming one, you may have already noticed this. They are raising the ante on what it takes to be a journalist. There was a time when all it took was a dedication to truth, plenty of energy, and some talent for writing. You still need those things, but they are no longer sufficient. The world has become so complicated, the growth of available information so explosive, that the journalist needs to be a filter as well as a transmitter, an organizer and interpreter, as well as one who gathers and delivers facts, In addition to knowing how to get information into print or on the air, he or she also must know how to get into the receiver's head. In short, a journalist has to be a database manager, a data processor, and a data analyst. Precision journalism is a classic globally, but it all started with you in 1967. When did you start getting acquainted with computers? When I registered at K-State, I had to write around, fill, fill out the information on IBM cards and write around the little holes. Mm. So they were using counter sorters then, not computers, but the IBM counter sorter, which was an old technology, almost 19th century technology. Wow. And, and that was my first awareness of, of modern data processing. So when you applied to Harvard to get the Neiman, did you say anything about the use of computers or social science techniques? Or oh, oh, yes. What was it that made you think like that? It was a uh, dystopian novel about the future where politicians use computer simulation to predict how various statements and, 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 and uh, policies will affect the electorate. And the timing put me at Harvard at just the moment when higher level computer languages for doing statistics in, in political science were available. And they were teaching 
computer programming to sophomores because it, it was possible with this, with this higher level language called Harvard Data Text. And that was really the, the, the genesis of, of precision journalism. There are some riots in Detroit in 1967. You start to see things uh, with different eyes maybe than you had a, a year earlier perhaps. Yes. Uh, can you describe sort of the intellectual f firmament of what, what was happening here? Right. The riot happened. It started on a, on a Sunday morning very early. And on Wednesday, uh, Derek Daniels, who had been my city editor in Miami, was now executive editor of the Free Press, called and said, our staff is exhausted. I need two fresh bodies. Send me two people. I was the one who answered the phone, so I got to send myself and, uh, and, and Saul Friedman. And that night, I was in the middle of the riot area, uh, in, at, at riding in a National Guard truck, looking at the flames, hearing shots in the night, and trying to piece together what was happening. And so I covered it with traditional shoe leather reporting for the rest of that week. And then by Sunday, when the riot had been quieted, we were sitting around the newsroom trying to figure out how to do the follow-up, because we knew this was Pulitzer material, and mm -hmm. the Detroit News was thinking the same thing. We were trying to think how to be one up on them. And it just happened that the University of California had finished a project on the Watts riot, which was two years earlier and had just published it. I think the AP carried it that same week. So I waved that around and I said, this, it took these professors two years to do this. We're journalists. We can do the same damn thing in, in three weeks. The social science research that was done with the Detroit riots that ends up winning the Pulitzer Prize, some coverage had certain uh, stereotypes that right. even seemed race, racial mm -hmm. in nature. Can you talk about what the presumptions were at the time of these riots, uh, particularly in white America and newspapers and maybe even newspapers in the Michigan area, and then what your social science research essentially debunked. And one of the characteristics of scientific method is that you don't start your research until you have a hypothesis to test, right. and, and then you try to knock it down. And the nice thing about doing this in journalism is you can test the conventional wisdom as your hypothesis. So all I had to do was what is the conventional wisdom about the causes of riots? And there were two, and, and, and they were contradictory. But there was a psychiatrist who specialized in the study of violence who said that it was caused by the, uh, the Detroit riot was caused by the failure of assimilation of southern blacks who moved to the urban north and, and couldn't adjust to it. And we could easily test that by just asking people who had rioted and then finding out if the rioters were more likely to be southern immigrants. And it was just the reverse. It was the people who had been born and raised in Detroit who were more likely to participate th wow. th than the immigrants. And the other one was called the riffraff theory, that the rioters are at the very bottom of the social scale. And they're the most desperate people who have nothing to lose. And the survey found that riot participation was spread pretty evenly across the socioeconomic uh, strata. Wow. So that left, uh, by default, the third theory, which was called several different things, uh, rising expectations, relative deprivation, that Detroit didn't expect to have a riot because they were making more progress in race relations than other urban cities, uh, parts of the urban north. And that was the source of frustration because some blacks were getting ahead, but not all, and those who weren't got more frustrated when they saw their, their peers getting ahead. My theory about ideas is every new idea is at least two old ideas reconfigured. Of course. And you essentially took uh, some social science methods, mm -hmm. methods from, say, political science and other social sciences, and blended it with the sensibilities of journalism and put it into a new thing called precision journalism, which blended those sensibilities. That's pretty much the definition of creativity, I think. To, yeah. to relating things not previously related. That yeah. they're not exactly th the same, but when you put them together, ooh, isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah. In the digital age, some people think that we don't need journalism anymore because everybody can just dip into the never-ending, never-beginning digital stream and take out what they want. But no, you need journalism more than ever to organize all that information. That's right. Only organized information makes, is of any value. And there are two ways to organize it. One with a narrative, storytelling, and the other is with scientific method, hypothesis testing and theory building. And if you can combine those two skills in one team, it'd be hard to do it in one head, but you could do it in one team, 
then you have something that will, people will pay attention to and something that can be very influential. Well, uh, you have just witnessed a conversation between two of my heroes in journalism. Uh, it was conducted by Charles Lewis, who, who was the founder of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism. Many of you must know it. Many, some of you may have collaborated with them. Uh, and once I met Chuck in Norway in an ICIJ meeting, uh, among so many great journalists from all over the world who are, who are the members of the ICIJ, and I, I told Chuck how humbled I was to be in such a company. And he told me, well, I get like this when I'm around Phil Meyer. And well, we all do. Well, books can change lives, books can change entire professions, and books can change the world. Precision Journalism just did all this. We are here tonight in Sao Paulo to honor a man I am proud to call my biggest inspiration in journalism. I owe, I owe him my career and really even the first conversation I had with my wife. Uh, he was the best professor I've ever had and we have corresponded over two decades and yet we never could shake hands. I shook Melissa's hands so many times uh, since yesterday that uh, uh, I'm, I'm sending enough DNA when she shakes his hand again. Uh, half a century ago, by this time of the year, uh, Phil Meyer had the final proofs of the first edition of Precision Journalism before it went to press. It is the book that kick-started what we now call data journalism. We would, we would not be here today without it. Phil turned 92 last week, so he could not come, but he's watching us at home uh, in North Carolina. Uh, let's applaud him, please. And uh, let's welcome also my dear friend, Melissa Meyer, who's proud who call him dad. Melissa, please, please applaud her, please. Yes. Thank you. Can you can is you, your mic you. working? I don't know, is it? Yep. Okay, so take it. Okay. Uh, Melissa, who, who is Phil to you? And what is the main thing he passed to you and her family? Well, I wanted to show these pictures of my sisters and I with my parents. Can you take the phone, take the mic? No, just, yes. My parents had two daughters, uh, two years apart, and then they waited uh, six years to have two more because I think they were trying for boys. So sometimes I like to think that um, I may have been the son that my father never had because we have a lot of similar interests and we're a lot alike. In fact, you mentioned shaking my hand well, that's a lot like shaking my dad's hand because my hands are <laughs> exact replicas of my dad's. Uh, that's good. So, so now I know how it is like to... 75% smaller. Okay. And he used to have a saying whenever we were um, leaving the house for a family outing, he would say to us kids, line up according to height. So if you guys would like to line up according to height after the session to take pictures with my hands... <laughs> They're just like my dad's. I'll, I'll, I'll sell a picture of my hands and you. One for five, two for ten. So um, I think that um, my dad and I were so much alike that uh, he, he took woodchop and he took um, technical drawing when he was growing up and so did I. And we both hated bullies. And he read that um, the C.S. Lewis essay called The Inner Ring, and um, he said that that was a reoccurring theme in his life about always um, being on the outside and, and never actually, it made him realize that he didn't want to penetrate the inner ring, that he'd rather be an ardent observer of life. And I feel like um, I'm the same way, an ardent observer. And it was such a concern to my parents that I was so quiet growing up, but their friends- Quiet? Yeah, I was really quiet, and they were really concerned. They thought that something was wrong with me, and their friends told them that those are the ones you need to watch out for. And so um, 
my dad and I both have um, permanent bags under our eyes because we like to do the work that's important, not the work that pays a lot. And um, I think that my dad was probably one of the first people to take his daughters to work before it was cool. So he took us, all, all of us girls, to work at different times, one at a time. Um, yeah, let, let me just interrupt you here. Uh, I had a boss, was my first boss in journalism, also used to take his daughter to work, and she took her to work so much that she's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so growing up, we got to um, go to the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., and my older sisters got to go to the Aspen Institute, and we all got to go on various trips to the Harvard Club and to the Miami Herald. So I think that had a big impact on me. Family trip there. In um, 1966, when I was born, a month after I was born, my dad did the application for the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard, and he got it. And I like to think that maybe I had some type of influence there. Maybe I was his lucky charm. But uh, it's also interesting to note that in 1966, um, it was still illegal for me to marry the person that I married. This is a picture of my husband and I when we were in second grade. We, we didn't meet until we were 15, but I, I think it's really interesting to know that in 1966, the year that my dad got the Neiman Fellowship to begin his really important work and kickstart his career, was not only the year that I was born, but it was also the, a year before interracial marriage became legal. So when we were born, it was still illegal. Yeah, uh, Phil covered all the, the desegregation of schools in the United States as an education reporter, and then he covered all the riots for civil rights uh, for black people in the United States, uh, and he, in the 90s, the, the, the late 80s and early 90s, he was analyzing census data to, to, to show how much of, uh, how much of segregation still remained in the United States. It was always a very important theme for him. And so when we were, when my sisters and I were growing up, my dad would always make it a point to read to us at, at night. And uh, some of the books that he read were the Wizard of Oz series. And then he moved on to his favorite, C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But then when I was 12, he handed me a book that was written by his best friend, Gene Miller, uh, uh, another Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the book was called Imitation to a Lynching. Not quite a 12-year-old appropriate reading, but it really op opened my eyes to the types of social issues that my dad and his friends were into. And I think that had a big impact on me as well. So good, so good. Thank you, Melissa. Well, let's begin with the testimonies. Uh, I interviewed many journalists I really admire and who have worked with Phil and who, who admire Phil and who have been students to Phil and some who, who were his colleagues in newsrooms. Uh, 19 years and 11 months ago, exactly to this day, uh, in December of 2002, a group of journalists uh, gathered together at the University of Sao Paulo to create the Brazilian Association of in Investigative Journalists, best known as Abraji. You all have been to their conferences. Uh, that's when I first met our next, our next guest, and I swear to you, the first question I did to him over lunch was, how's Phil really like? Uh, this is Brent Houston. Phil initially referred to some of us that were spreadsheets and database managers as data cowboys. Um, I think he thought we weren't going to advance over counting a lot of things. Uh, but as we got together, I think he saw how much we wanted to learn other techniques how to deal with statistics and things like that. So I, I think after a while he forgave us for our data cowboy ship. He changed journalism globally and forever. Um, Phil helped us enter into the world of data and understanding data and working with numbers in a sensible way that did stories, um, not just stories about numbers, but about social injustice and in the causes of it. Um, so Phil just, you know, he brought us into the 21st century. He had to work 25 years in the 20th century to get us there, 
but in terms of journalism, um, he changed everything, changed everything for me. Um, I got into data in 19, oh, when was it? 85, 86. And fortunately, Phil had trained some people in, um, in the Knight Ritter group, <laughs> now gone, but uh, he, he trained what I consider the people I consider the pioneers like Steve Doig and, and others. Um, and so when I got into journalism, I was working with very basic software, but pretty quickly I got into a story on the setting of bail in the United States and I came across Phil's book and Phil was recommended to me as a person to watch by Steve Doig, who's one of my mentors. And fortunately, as time went along, Phil became one of my mentors, uh, particularly in the mid 90s when I started running the NICAR workshops. And it was clear to me that we could do the basics really well, maybe some of the advanced stuff, but we needed to um, to link up with Phil, who was doing the more advanced uh, kinds of data analysis and who understood things like lurking variables and, and things that we, we were starting to discover ourselves. Um, and I think Phil was gracious and civil, as he always is. And so we were able to start doing workshops with Phil. And that really created this curriculum that started in the U.S. but went global. Abraji and Brazilian journalists went so quickly. Once the tools were out there, once the knowledge was there, uh, you know, in a few years, they were able to do what it took U.S. journalists 20, 25 years to do. One of the interesting moments for me is I was working on the first edition of my book and I kept saying to Phil, this isn't trying to be your book. I'm just trying to get people ready for you. Um, and I said, you know, we've really been screwing up the reporting on labor issues um, because we use average, like in the U.S., for baseball salaries. And because they're outliers, stars in sports, all the salaries, you know, basically are distorted upwards. And so we think every baseball player is a millionaire. And we need to use median. A bunch of us have talked about it. We're trying to get the industry to use it uh, because you're favoring management if you just look at average salaries. And, but median will correct for outliers. So Phil and I went over this. Poor Phil. He spent like a half an hour with me. Like, how do we explain this to journalists? And of course, he said, well, median is easy. It's the middle value. I said, that's not going across. I said, I need images for the journalists. So I think after that discussion, we worked on ideas of having a stack of books and showing people their 10 books above and 10 books below. And, and using baseball salaries was a great example uh, of doing that. But to think that Phil was gracious enough to you know, spend a half hour with me on how to effectively teach median is a pretty amazing story for, let's see, that would have been 25, 30 years ago. Um, and that's, you know, that was Phil, though. He would take the time to make sure that people would understand what decent analysis of data was and what it meant to people and how it could impact policy. And, um, it, you know, that's, that's how he changed the world. He changed the world with large groups of journalists. He changed the world in journalism with one journalist at a time. Um, very few people can say they've done that. Yeah, that's Brent Houston. And the next guest is someone who was here in the last presidential edition of CODA before the pandemic. Uh, he's now a professor and he runs projects many of you know. He was also the first editor of the Inter interactive news team at the New York Times. Uh, let's hear Adam Pilhofer. So for me, when I got into data journalism, and this would have been in the early 90s, you know, Phil Meyer was um, a god. And uh, I remember when I first picked up precision journalism uh, and started reading, uh, devouring it. Um, it was the first time that I felt like there are other people like me out there that uh, I sort of in a weird way kind of felt, you know, seen like there is a community of people who think the way I do. And I was lucky enough um, 
to actually get to go to one of the statistics boot camps that Phil ran um, in North Carolina. And as you know, now that I'm an instructor myself, now that I'm a professor, um, I can't tell you how, um, what a wonderful teacher Phil is and how inspirational he is and how he is able to take incredibly complex um, concepts and make them understandable. Um, it's the first time I ever really truly understood regression. Uh, I under finally understood probability um, and he was able to do it using M&Ms. He handed everybody a bag of M&Ms and uh, based on probability, you could essentially predict the distribution of M&Ms in the, across the classroom in an individual bag. And it helped you understand how like polling worked, like why it is that you can talk to two, 300 people. And that is mathematically, statistically speaking, representative of an entire country um, within a certain um, margin of error. And it, it truly, you know, it, it brought these concepts uh, down to earth in a way that, you know, I could understand it, not being a statistician by training or trade. Um, and I walked out of there with a toolkit, um, that was two, three, four, five times as, as large as it was when I walked in. Uh, he's truly inspirational. You know, in addition to being absolutely brilliant and one of a handful of uh, people who actually truly founded uh, what we think of as data journalism today. He also is a staggeringly nice, caring, wonderful person. He had us all over for dinner and was just so down to earth and so kind and always available and always happy to answer questions. You know, for me, Phil Meyer was a God then, he's a God now. Um, I absolutely ad adore him. Uh, all the interviewees are also watching us uh, live on YouTube. So if you want to applaud Aaron, please feel welcome to. And uh, Melissa, Aaron and Brent uh, told us about how inspiring Phil is as a professor. You are a professor also of architecture. And how, how did that kindness uh, of teaching uh, manifest at home? Well, I think um, growing up, the conversations that would happen around the breakfast and dinner table had a big impact on me. It kind of goes along with me being really quiet and just listening a lot and observing when I was a kid. So I think my parents didn't realize how much I was paying attention to what they were talking about. So one of the conversations that I recall when I was little when we lived in Washington, D.C. was about my dad going across the street to Chuck Stone's house. Uh, one of his um, co-workers at UNC Chapel, also a journalist. But um, the, back then in D.C., Malcolm X would come over to Chuck's house and during the civil rights movement, and my dad and Chuck would spend a lot of time trying to convince him that it was not a good idea to resort to violence during the civil rights movement. So that was one of the conversations that I recall. And another one was um, my two older sisters and my accompanied my mom to the March on Washington and there were some riots going on during the I Have a Dream speech, and uh, my mom and my sisters got maced. I was too little to attend, but I was cheering them on from my crib at home, like this. Uh, so that's another story. And then I also re remember um, my dad just reading the Miami Herald at breakfast and cracking up. And I always wanted to know what was so funny and why he was laughing at the Miami Herald articles so much. So uh, as soon as I went off to college, I got my own subscription to the Miami Herald. Even though I went to college in North Carolina, the News and Observer was pretty boring back then and the Miami Herald was pretty funny sometimes. So um, my, my dad would always talk about his trips to Miami when I was little. And um, because I think because he read so much C.S. Lewis to us when we were growing up. It expanded my imagination. And whenever he mentioned Miami, in my head, I thought that 
every person on earth must have an Amy. <laughs> and I want to go to my Amy. And in my imagination, which is pretty vivid, um, I imagined that an Amy was like um, a, fount a fountain of youth, like a vast tropical spring that w with beautiful waterfalls and, and um, tropical fo foliage, and that every single person on earth had one of those, and it was called an Amy, and I wanted to go to mine. Is that why you <laughs> went to your Amy? Yeah, so after I graduated from college, I went back to M Miami, and that's where I live now. And so, um, in, the, in the work that I do with my students as, as an adjunct professor, and also in um, the work in, in my neighborhood as a community activist, I got to hook up with my father's friends. So Arbor Parks is, was a, she passed away recently, but she is a, um, she was a historian and preservationist. And she and I worked together to try to save this um, historic church that was built in Miami in 1912. It happened to be the church that um, my family attended for 12 years, the Episcopal Church. And um, they were, I was a, one of the architects, one of the design architects on this project that, where they were building a school on this site. But I did a design that was uh, to preserve the historic chapel and build a school around it and a retail building around it. But what ended up happening was uh, I ended up being the whistleblower on their project because the real scheme was to tear it down and build a, a, re a retail building in its place. And so I would always ask my dad his advice, that, like, Dad, do you think I should tell the truth about what, what's really going on on this project that I'm working on? And his answer would always be, of course. And so he let me know I, I, need, if I have to make a choice. I either have to be part of the inner ring and keep quiet, or I have to tell the truth and be the whistleblower, and I had to make a choice. So I, be I became the whistleblower on a lot of projects in Miami. And so that served me well as, a, um, as an adjunct professor because I get to inst cool. instill those values in, in my students. And so um, some of the other things that, we, that I do as, a, as an adjunct professor is I try to encourage my students to um, remedy the ills of segregation in, in our neighborhood. Um, what's currently going on there is um, we we ended up um, confronting the city of Miami because they weren't following the zoning the zoning codes, and so I ended up um, telling the truth about that and organizing community members and raising money to file a lawsuit against the city of Miami to force them to follow the zoning codes. And the reason why that was important and how it relates to um, the work of my parents is because uh, my dad and my mom were part of neighborhood Neighborhoods Inc. in Washington, D.C. because they really cared about uh, affordable housing and the ramifications of gentrification and um, affordable housing and equal um, opportunities for people of color. And so those are the, I tie those themes into my projects that I teach at, uh, at Miami Day College. And so, so you're keeping your Emmy nice and diverse. <laughs> Yeah, I'm working on it. And yeah, so this is one of my students wh whose project got picked. And uh, the theme of the project was to remedy the ills of segregation. And in, in this particular neighborhood wh that she'd made this model of, um, there was, there's still a barbed wire fence cool. separating the black neighborhood and the white neighborhood from, um, from, from each other. The actual barbed wire fence is still there. So this is her redesign of the project. And it got picked uh, to be presented to the Miami City Commission commissioner to, to try to see if we can make some of the things that were showing up in her project um, cool. happen. So that was kind of uh, cool. Just, uh, is there more pictures? Uh, uh, yeah. Let me ask you just one thing. Uh, everyone must have noticed we are wearing bow ties here. And uh, the bow tie is a trademark of Phil Meyer. You, uh, most of his pictures, most of his official pictures, he's wearing one. And what, what uh, I asked Melissa to, uh, this afternoon, what do bow ties mean to Phil Meyer? And she asked him, she asked her sister to ask him, what did he answer? Um, he, he's, they asked him that question today and he responded to give the other sixth graders something to talk about. Yeah, and there's an actor named Harold Lloyd who was the inspiration for Clark Kent. And my dad was reading that when he was 
in sixth grade or around that time period. So I think that that's where the inspiration came for him to show off in front of the sixth graders and give them something to talk about. So yeah, he, he was talking about that today. Yeah, that's why Clark Kent is taking a bow to feel <laughs> in, the, in that cartoon. Well, uh, you seen Aaron talk about the, the boot camp where, where Phil taught, uh, and it was offered also by the investigative reporters and editors, the IRE. That's the association that inspired the creation of Abrage. And our next two guests uh, were alongside Phil in the Stats and Maps boot camps in North Carolina. Uh, Sarah Cohen currently chairs the Phil Meyer Awards. And uh, Jennifer LaFleur is another really nice person who she was the assistant to them in the courses. And she took one of the greatest pictures of Phil ever. Please, uh, let's see the video first, Sarah, and then Jennifer. When I first heard about him and first read Precision Journalism, I was like, great, this is what I want to do. And I don't think I could have ever had the career I've had without the groundwork that he laid, which I think a lot of people forget about Phil is that he was at heart and is at heart a journalist and a reporter. Um, even when people talk about his work in the Detroit riots as, as um, a, a defining moment in precision journalism, they forget that he was a reporter on the ground as well. And that that idea came from being a reporter on the ground as much as from the academy. The, the award was the brainchild of um, Ted Melnick, who at the time worked at the Charlotte Observer, then spent many years at the Washington Post and just retired in the last few months. And he felt that IRE should sponsor an award um, that honored the kind of work that Phil advocated which is the use of scientific method in reporting. Their other awards are purely for investigative work, you know, uncovering something that somebody wants to keep secret. Um, the Phil Meyer Award was something different in that it would honor explanatory work or even features if that was the way it was. And instead, what it, it recognizes is the melding of scientific method with journalistic values. One of the reasons that the Phil Meyer Award is so special is that it, it recognizes the things that journalists do right. And we so often spend time on what we do wrong or what we are kind of, we're on the edges of things and this is all about what we do right. I came to journalism late in life and, um, I had been an economist for 10 years before I went to graduate school. So as soon as I got to graduate school, I kind of stumbled on precision journalism, and this was in the early 90s. And so Phil was kind of a um, uh, something that really inspired me, thinking that I could apply what I had learned as an economist and as a social scientist to reporting, I didn't realize when I had gone into the graduate program that there might be room for that. I was kind of in awe of Phil long before I ever met him and long before I even wrote my first story as a professional. When I discovered that I would be working with Phil on statistics boot camps, I was just so excited. My favorite way of his teaching was when he would talk about how to work with Z-scores, which is uh, a statistical way of working with averages across things. He would always talk about how do you tell whether a football player is faster than he is smart. And so, uh, <laughs> so, so it was a way of like relative averages is what he was talking about. But um, so he had this way of making sure that people understood what he was talking about. And I just I have that faster than smart in the back of my head all the time now when I think about how to compare things. He is so often viewed as a researcher about the future of journalism or about newspapers or about his social science work. And he was really focused at that time on how what he did as a reporter influenced the way he thought about that. 
And so he would tell our students about being a reporter in the um, Knight Ritter Bureau in Washington and going down to the basement of Congress to look through records because nobody would talk to him because he was from small newspapers and he wanted to have the same power that everybody else had. Uh, please, uh, the Jennifer LaFleur video. Uh, you, can, you can applaud, uh, you can applaud Sarah, she's watching, she has the link to the video. Yeah. And so now Jennifer LaFleur. He had that sense of humor. He had that like, um, you know, he wore a bow tie made out of um, <laughs> computer cards and we all did. And he had a lot of fun with that. I helped make the bow tie and I wore a bow tie. Yeah, absolutely. I met Phil when I was training director at IRE. Um, and I was in one of his, he used to do these boot camps called Stats and Maps um, that were statistics in SPSS and mapping. They were at, um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I went to one as a student and then I think I went to another one when I was a trainer to just like help coach and things like that. What I, as a teacher now, looking back at what, how I learned from him, he was very um, precise and patient and was able to like seamlessly weave stories of his, you know, his work in newspapers um, and his work doing this kind of um, analyses seamlessly into like something we were trying to learn that was much harder, which I think made it a lot easier to learn. So we weren't just getting like pounded with, hard things, but we were really learning like how this applies, how this is important, how it tells stories that can actually make a difference. I was a little afraid of him because he seemed very stern at first, but what I came to know is he was so generous with his time and so helpful to all of us that wanted to learn how to do more sophisticated analysis in our work. So um, I'm so grateful that um, I got to bug him many times over the years. You know, I, I could call him and ask him questions and um, did many times. So I'm so grateful for that um, opportunity. One of the reporters at uh, on my team at the Center for Investigative Reporting, Emmanuel Martinez, he started Precision Journalism Reading Club in the newsroom. And they all met first thing in the morning to go through the book together. Um, and so when I left, I gave Emmanuel my um, signed copy, signed from Phil. I went to um, graduate school at Missouri. And in the early days when, um, you know, NICAR and IRE were just forming. So I think I probably learned about it then. And I, to this day, there are certain pages I use as a reference or to tell other people um, I use it with my students uh, because I think, you know, even though the last version might be several years old, so much of it still applies to what we're doing and why what we're doing is so important. It was great to see, you know, this whole new generation learning from Phil and, um, you know, getting to share in what we were able to share in. Yeah, uh, Jennifer is my friend on Facebook for more than 10 years, and I had never seen her face before this interview, because she's very skilled in not showing up in pics. So Jennifer, now that, uh, that, now that I got you flanked, please applaud Jennifer. Yeah, uh, just uh, uh, in the 80s, uh, Phil became, I will jump to the, the, because you answered that, that question before. <laughs> and uh, in the 80s, Phil became a, a consultant for the USA Today newspaper. Uh, he was advising on audience development and data analysis. And in the late 80s, uh, he recruited for them the first ever data journalism team in the whole world, in the late 80s. Uh, it was a group of hard-hitting reporters uh, who, crunched who crunched data for investigations. We have testimonies here from three of those reporters from that group. The first testimony for, is from someone who was here, also in the last presidential edition of CODA before the pandemic. Cheryl Phillips, please. 
I met Phil pretty early on in my effort to learn about data journalism. So, uh, he, you know, I he taught he told me about precision journalism right not long after I met him, and then um, I, I'm not sure if I still have it, but uh, you know, he used to give away a copy of his book if you could get a scatter plot published in the paper. And I did get a scatter plot published in the Detroit News, and he did give me a copy of his book because of that. Well, I mean, I think I would describe him in two different ways. I mean, just as a person, I I would I would describe him as um, uh, kind and giving of his time, at the same time being sharp witted and and not afraid to engage in the weeds with folks about like what works and what doesn't. But but so good at just um, kind of there's there's no crime in not knowing right like it's like it was all about like let me just teach you let me just walk you through what this is going to take and and um so just very giving of his of his time and from on a professional uh kind of journalistic level i would say you know um just a really sharp aggressive journalist right i mean like he did work that that changed things and changed the way people thought about how journalism could be done he thought at a level that journalists were not thinking about and, and really moved the field. I mean, he, he moved, he created the field, really, in many ways. First met Phil when I was on loan to USA Today in 1995. And at that point, I had done, I guess, my first data story a few years before that when I used a spreadsheet. But beyond that, I had not really. And I mean, I could sort and <laughs> filter maybe. Uh, and so then I was assigned to the projects desk, the enterprise desk at, at USA Today. And Phil was on retainer with them as a consultant. And I had covered, uh, in a previous interview, I had covered the business side of baseball. And there was a baseball strike that summer. And so uh, Phil was interested in taking a look at the economic impact of the baseball strike and doing some analyses off of that. And I knew a fair bit about the business of baseball uh, because that's what I had covered um, down in Texas with the Texas Rangers. And so he taught me uh, how to do that analysis. And uh, you taught me SPSS. And that was my introduction to statistics was Phil. And um, it was amazing. And so like literally spent hours with me side by side, what they would call pair programming today teaching me how to think about the questions, how to frame it, how to ask uh, the right questions to get, you know, accurate answers and um, hooked me, just hooked me right into it. And I was like, okay. And that was, uh, and that, you know, was, um, you know, with Phil and then also the data editors there, that was my real deep dive into learning how to use data for, for really good accountability stories. And, and then a year later, a year later, I was, I had moved on and I had, I was at the Detroit News and I did a NICAR workshop, a boot with stats, maps, and something else. And Sarah Cohen was the trainer with, uh, Phil Meyer at UNC. And so, uh, so I got to see Phil again and, and went to dinner at his, you know, with his wife and at this, with his whole cohort and, and then later I went back to USA Today in the early 2000s and he was, and I worked on the, on the sports desk and he helped me build an impact index for baseball and then for hockey. And so I got to work with him again where we like, he helped me build the index and figure out how to, you know, find the right measures. And, um, and he's just always been incredibly give, I would routinely call him up like, for years in my career, I would I could call him up and say, "This is what I'm doing, Phil. Does it make sense?" And he would tell me why it didn't, and help me along my path. So uh, I, I do not think I would have had the career I have had without Phil. Yeah, uh, please let's applaud Cheryl. She's watching us also, and if you have questions, please write them and give them to to the people at the staff. Uh, because at the end we we will answer them. Uh, let's see the video. But this one, this video especially, came this afternoon after lunch. You you, you can't imagine how excited people are uh, to those great journalists to talk about Phil. Uh, we we all love Phil. He made 
such a difference in our lives. Uh, so let's see Sean McIntosh. She writes one of the blurbs of, of Phil's biography who's, that's exposed down there with me. Uh, let's, uh, let's see Sean McIntosh. I started at the University of North Carolina about the same time Phil Meyer did. He was a professor and I was a student, but our paths didn't cross immediately. I was a biology major, even though I wanted to be a journalist, because my dad had told me journalism would be a crappy career and I wouldn't make any money and I needed to be a doctor. I didn't tell dad when I changed my major to journalism. I knew I had made the right decision when I landed in Phil's class. He absolutely set me on fire with inspiration. Phil made journalism fun with his bow tie and his funny stories and his great way of talking about statistics. I remember when he described the concept of margin of error for survey results. And he said the, the margin of error measured whether the results were this goofy or goofier. He went with me to the basement of the University Computer Center the first time I did an analysis and loaded those punch cards and he was as excited as I was to read the results and help me understand them when they came out on that long green computer paper. I don't even remember what my class project measured, but it involved alcohol-related deaths, and I had to visit the university morgue at the hospital regularly to get information from their files for my analysis. It was so much more fun than organic chemistry, and I knew I was hooked for life on investigative journalism and data journalism. After I graduated, Phil kept a hand on my career. He helped me with my first investigative project at the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. I was working on the accounting department's original Macintosh computer at night after they go had gone home for the evening. The story I ultimately published won an award and changed the law. So what could be better than that? When USA Today created the nation's first computer-assisted reporting department, Phil was recruiting for them and he brought me on board. He consulted for USA Today and I worked for them and I got the joy of collaborating on many projects with him. I remember being so proud when we published an index that helped measure the diversity of communities for the 1990 census results. It's still used in some form today. Our projects range from serious investigations to fun because, you know, USA Today was as much about pop culture as Big J journalism. We created ways to measure the health of the country's failing savings and loan institutions and when they would go out of business. But we also analyzed the results of the Miss America pageants to determine the factors that were most likely to predict a win. Turned out, Big feet was the winning factor, apparently a proxy for height. With others on the team, we moved from powerful mainframe computers to these incredible new PCs that were coming out and allowing data journalism to spread to many more newsrooms. I remember our first PC rig cost $74,000. It was souped up to measure the, to analyze the 1990 census and it included a tape drive so that we could read mainframe tapes. It didn't hold as much as a routine thumb drive holds today. It was during those years that I got involved with investigative reporters and editors and their newly created National Institute for Computer Assistive Reporting. Phil's gospel began to spread to journalism across the country alongside the teachings of Elliot Jaspin from the University of Missouri, IRA's home. I can say with total confidence that without Phil and without investigative reporters and editors, I would not have had the successful career I have been blessed with. And I am so grateful for that career, a career mostly about investigative journalism, data journalism, and newsroom leadership. I've had the pleasure and the honor of helping reporters do stories that saved lives and righted wrongs. Thank you, Phil, for inspiring me and so many others. I hope I have done you proud. Uh, Sean is now the, the, the top editor at the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and uh, she's covering a nasty election <laughs> in the US. Nearly, not nearly as crazy as our election, but anyway, uh, it's, it's keeping her too busy, and she took the time to, to record this video this morning. Uh, Melissa, uh, 
As we saw Sean telling us here, Phil helped create a racial diversity index at USA Today in the 90s. And, and uh, race relations is a theme that runs across very often in Phil's career as a, an education reporter at the Detroit riots and so on. Uh, and it does show up in his life also, right? So maybe by osmosis or um, just being around my dad a lot, I somehow I learned to incorporate um, polls and statistics into the projects that I was passionate about that had to. That, that, that's still the previous. Uh, that's go, go on. That, 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 that's. Yeah. Uh, I'm, get, I'm getting there, but I wanted to go back to this one for a second because okay. um, when, with the lawsuits that we have against the city of Miami for, tearing, for attempting to tear down our historic landmarks and for not um, respecting the zoning code, which is displacing African Americans and not respecting the um, historic streets that were founded by the original black Bahamians in, in Miami. So, so to um, get support for those lawsuits and to fundraise, I used polls on social media. And so I guess that's something that I learned from my dad without realizing it. And so that's how a lot of the lawsuits and activism um, type projects that I have going on with my friends and colleagues in Miami got started by creating polls on social media. And so I also realized um, early on as when I became a parent that how to manipulate the media to get things uh, done. Uh, well, so it's you. Yeah, and so, um, when it, so when my son was born in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, there was this group called LIFE, the LIFE group. It, was to, it stood for Learning for Interracial Family Enrichment. And I thought that it was really silly that such a group would be necessary because growing up in um, diverse neighborhoods, I, I just didn't think that that was a thing that was needed. But it turns out that we made a lot of really good friends in that group. And I really listened to some of their concerns. And one of them was when they went to um, register their interracial kids or multiracial kids for school, they were, the kids were forced or the parents were forced to choose black or white. And, and, and that the kid would be um, forced to identify either with the race of their mother or the race of their father. So they were put, the, the child would be put into an uncomfortable position early on. And the parents didn't like that. And, and they said that they weren't going to do it. Instead, they were going to um, claim a religious exemption. That They were going to try to say that they weren't going to fill out the, the form to register their kid for school because it was against their religion. And I thought, well, that's pretty silly. You shouldn't have to do that. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So when it came time to register our son to, at school, um, I went and to, to the office and filled out the registration form. And I chose all the races that he is, black, white, and American Indian. And then um, they handed me the form back and said, no, sorry, if you want your child to come to school here, you're going to have to choose one or the other, um, a single race. And so I gave them the form back and I said, um, OK, well, I'll be back tomorrow. And so I went back the next day and I brought my, my husband and my son and the local newspaper reporters and the local TV news reporters. So they were all standing behind me and then I, I asked to register for my son for school and they handed me the paper again and I checked black, white, and American Indian and gave it back to them. And then on camera and in front of the reporters, they told me that my son would not be allowed to attend school there unless we chose a race for him to identify with on the form. And so that jump started um, a, a whole movement and we, we were interviewed by lots of newspapers the, around the country uh, and we were on um, Dateline and NBC News and CBS News and we were in Time Magazine with an article with T Tiger Woods, that's what this is. Uh, and that's much. us registering Jordan for school. Yeah. And then um, and a you, compromise with, with the school district was that they would add a multiracial category. But, it, but then it led to, uh, they knew the, that we were going to go after the U.S. Census next to be able to give people the opportunity to choose more than one race. And so because the Office of Management and Budget knew that we already had the ACLU backing us and they were representing us, and they knew that they weren't going to win, so they just went ahead and made the changes anyhow, because they knew where we were coming. So. Yeah. And you told me also that, that Phil did a seminar about, about uh, race classification, right? 
uh, at the university, if you call the seminar at uh, the university, is that right? Yeah, so my dad and um, Chuck Stone, the journalist who was one of his very best friends, they had a seminar on the issue, and I was one of the guest speakers for the seminar, and the students and reporters came at, to learn more about why we thought it was important. So uh -huh. yeah, during that time, we were interviewed a lot we were on like local television shows and Ma magazine and newspaper reporters and television and news and so they wanted to know what our motivation was and our, our motivation was that we wanted our son and we had a daughter too to be proud of their entire um, heritage and because I thought that was really important for positive self-esteem and so um, yeah. my dad was really adamant about teaching me and my sisters about our family history and he and my mother took lots of trips to Switzerland and Ireland and uh, and got in touch with ancestors there and he documented all of our family history and so I got the that from my dad wanting to teach my children about all of their family history and be oh. proud of their entire background so it was just unimaginable for me to have instill in them that one part of the history was more important than the other so it was just a no-brainer yeah well well thank you thank you and the next video okay, okay. can you put the, the okay and the next video uh is is a really rare kind of person uh there are few very very few journalists remain who remember phil meyer before he became known for precision journalism uh, but there's al shuster Al Schuster was the world editor at the Los Angeles Times. He was a correspondent for the New York Times. And uh, he kindly talked to Kathy, one of Melissa's sisters, and we have a video of him here. I'm here today waiting the call of my father's former colleague from the Neyman Fellowship that met at Harvard University. Thank you very much, Kathy. My name is uh, Alvin Schuster, and I was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard with Phil, who was somewhat of a mystery. Here was the class of 1966-67, and we were hard at work attending the lectures of Harvard's greats, who gave us the highlights of French, Russian, American history, maybe even Brazilian history, Supreme Court crises, wars, peace, Italian art, and more. Not for Phil. We rarely saw Phil. Why? He was working away downstairs in the basement at Harvard and not wasting his time, he said, but developing computer knowledge. What did I tell him? I said, Phil, it's not going to work. We're not going to be interested in that. We use typewriters. We are used to typewriters. We like the click and the clack in newsrooms. And what you're proposing is going to eliminate that. We like finishing a story on a typewriter, calling copy, and a young intern runs over, grabs your story, and takes it to the editors. That's what we like. So it turns out that Phil was right and I was wrong. Along came precision journalism which deserves all of its accolades, including that one, of course, tonight. Okay, it was truly important what Phil was doing. It helped change the way we worked. I knew it was a vital statement. I knew it was a vital element. The day I wrote a wonderful story on a typewriter, well, really on my computer, and called copy, and nobody came. How sad. Anyway, as for myself, I was a foreign correspondent for the New York Times, serving as bureau chief in London, Saigon, and Rome. And then I became the foreign editor of the Los Angeles Times. And I recall those days with Phil with great pleasure. Now, I should add one more thing. My typewriter is in the garage. Cheers, Phil. All the best. I really, 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 really love this video. And the next video is, is 
is from a legend. It's from a guy. Uh, uh, he, he, in fact, helped me uh, win my first journalist award uh, because of Phil. Phil put me in touch with him. Uh, in 1972, more or less at the same time as the Watergate story broke, uh, he, this guest, and his colleague Don Barlett, uh, they asked for Phil's help to investigate patterns of sentencing for crime in Philadelphia. Phil is so proud of the work they did together that he tells the story in every edition of Precision Journalism. Let's hear from Jim Steele. James Steele. I suppose the best way to find out whether or not you like somebody is to work with them from midnight to 5 or 6 a.m. for a couple weeks at a time <laughs> and see how the relationship is. But Phil Phil is just such a hardworking guy, but such a decent man, and yet he's so committed to getting a story right and to helping his colleagues and to not you know, blowing his own horn in any way. Uh, I mean, I think Phil... I mean, Phil is one of the great figures, I think, in journalism over the last 50 years. But he would probably blush if he heard me say that to his face. Don and I, uh, in, in Philadelphia back in 1972, just yesterday, of course, uh, it was a very big issue in the city in terms of crime. Uh, judges were being accused by politicians of letting hardened criminals out on the street uh, or giving them light sentences. So like good journalists, we simply ask the question, well, we wonder what's really going on here. Are these charges, is there any validity to these things? Uh, is there anything behind this? But again, when we started asking, well, what kinds of data is there about this? We really just ran into a stone wall. Nobody seemed to really have it. So we decided to use uh, cases of violent crime from the year 1971. Origi ultimately, we ended up with 39% uh, of the total categories of murder, rape, robbery, and assault for that year. I mean, it was a huge sample. We designed a form, a one-page form, that had such things as the name of the defendant, the name of the lawyer, the name of the judge, what the sentence was, what the verdict was, whether it was a jury trial. It was like 40 to 50 individual bits of information about every particular case. We called Phil because we knew he had been, of course, involved in the famous Detroit riots study. We talked to him about what we had, the hundreds of cases that we'd gone through already. And, of course, he was ecstatic because here was this incredible volume of, of raw data just waiting to be analyzed. So Phil uh, said, look, I'll, I'll write the program. You guys keep working away at what you're doing, working your way through the cases. I'll write the program, uh, and we'll go from there. Of where we had to take the information from these cases and, 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 and take the program he had written and convert the information to graph paper. That graph paper was then taken into a commercial operation, which converted those to IBM punch cards. All young people today have no idea what these punch cards were, but that was the way you analyzed data back in those days with big computers in the hopes that we would be able to run these, this program on the inquirer's computer. Well, it turned out the computer wasn't big enough. We had, that, we had so much information. They weren't able to, to do the processing. And they'll never forget the day he called he called one day and he said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. He said, I found a contractor that can handle a, a data set of this magnitude. And uh, we're, we can hire them and, they, and the cost is not particularly expensive. We can do it. He said, the downside of it is um, their computers are only available from midnight to 5 a.m. So <laughs> one of the things that was so great about Phil and which really was, I think, the stimulus that got him into this whole field was that he used to do a lot of political reporting in Ohio, I think, when he was with the Akron paper. And he would go out and he would interview somebody on their front porch who had this feeling or that feeling about a candidate who was running for office, and they'd write the story about this person. And sometimes it'd be that, that their candidate wouldn't win, even though they thought that person was representative of the state. 
And that's what drove, I think, Phil, as much as anything, to the desire to want to find a way to be more scientific about coming to the conclusions we come to. And that was this was a perfect example about why this project, uh, why he loved the project, and, and we were just in, in debt to him uh, that he gave the time to it and his enthusiasm and, of course, his intelligence and his skills to write the kind of program that would that would get at the basic issues that we were trying to, to find out. So uh, I think it had gotten all the way to the Pulitzer board. It was either a Pulitzer jury, but he remembered that it didn't get any farther than that because somebody on one of those committees said, I'm not going to, we're not going to award a Pulitzer to anybody who's used a computer in a news story. <laughs> Bill Meyer is, well, I, I guess I would start with the word brilliant uh, as, a, as a journalist and as a, basically a, as a scientist, uh, somebody who understands the process, who he's, he's of that mindset. He doesn't want to just seize on the most sensational thing. He really wants to know what the full story is. And working with Phil back in those days was, was a tremendous joy because Phil is so even keeled. Uh, so unemotional about the work that's involved there. But of course, when we would come up with one cross tab that showed something particularly revealing, like the way one particular judge uh, showing a pattern totally at odds with what his public image was, we would all get a great uh, joy out of that and and, and, and a cheerful laugh and so forth over over those kinds of things. I think if you could work with somebody like that all the time, uh, there'd be a lot less uh, discord in the world. I can, I can say that. Yeah, that's Jim Steele. Please applaud him because he's watching us. <laughs> and let's hear from another of my journalism heroes. Uh, and whenever Phil wrote about objectivity in journalism, uh, Galeno brought this question, uh, he said you did not... did. You do not need to distance yourself completely from the story to tell it properly. And his best example was a reporter whose home and neighborhood were destroyed by a hurricane. And digging on data, he found out a case of corruption and making people's lives unsafe. Let's hear from Steve Doig, please. I absolutely owe my long and successful career as a data journalist and professor to Phil Meyer. I was a young reporter at the Miami Herald in the late 1970s, trying to stand out in a very competitive newsroom. I was pretty sure I would never be as gifted a writer or as aggressive an interviewer or as dogged a sleuth as some of the stars who I worked among. But one day, Professor Meyer, wearing his signature bow tie, came to the Herald to give a talk about precision journalism. Those of us who attended were given a copy of that first edition. I read it through, then I read it again, and began to think, that well, maybe data analysis could be my latent superpower. By then, I was working in the Herald State Capitol Bureau, and I had bought an Atari 800 computer to play with at home. But with Phil and precision journalism in mind, I began seeing ways to use that computer for simple value-added stories, like comparing campaign finance records to legislative roll call votes. When the Bureau needed a new writing terminal, I persuaded the bosses to get one of the then newfangled IBM PCs, which I loaded with DBase and VisiCalc spreadsheet software. I used the basic programming language to write a roll call analysis program that would reveal hidden coalitions of interest beyond political party. Thanks to precision journalism and my experience doing stories with census data and property tax rolls and campaign finance records, I was prepared the next year when Hurricane Andrew trashed nearly 100,000 homes in Miami, including mine. The level of damage was a shock because we had heard for years that South Florida had the toughest building code in the nation. So in the, year, in the weeks after the storm, I began processing tens of thousands of damage reports and matching them with property records, looking for a pattern that would help explain why this was such a disaster. And very quickly, I found a clear smoking gun. The newer the home, the more likely to be destroyed. 
That led us to analyze the campaign contributions of, of county officials who had weakened the building code and the building department records that revealed a pattern of shoddy inspections. We published all this as an 18-page special section called What Went Wrong that was a key element to the Herald winning the Pulitzer for public service that year. I talked to Phil about the idea of going into academia, and he did his best to get me admitted into an accelerated doctoral program at Chapel Hill. But I disappointed him by completely flunking the admissions interview, thanks to my own ambivalence about finances and living apart from my family. As Phil told me afterwards, I had managed to go from being the top candidate to firmly rejected. But the idea of becoming an academic had been planted, and a couple years later, I joined Arizona State University as a Knight professor, just like Phil. Since then, I've taught thousands of students and trained hundreds of professionals around the world, simply because long ago, I told myself, I want to be Phil Meyer when I grow up. Uh, Steve, so so I want so I do. Uh, please applaud Steve. He's watching us too. Yeah, uh, Steve's story was featured in the latest edition of Proceeding Journalism. But the first time uh, you talked to me, we found out you are also a character there, right? In Proceeding Journalism. Yeah. So. Uh, An unnamed character. Right. You must be talking about the fake ID. Yeah. The f uh, the, right. Did you fake ID? Yeah, so... Why, why, why the hell would you do fake ID? <laughs> Do I have a picture? Uh, oh. it's, it's ahead. It's, uh, the, yes, that, that one. No, before that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so... Okay. When we moved from Miami to Chapel Hill, I, in, I mean, Miami, Coconut Grove, where I live now, that's where I used to hang out. I used to ride my bike from where we were living in Core Gables to Coconut Grove because... We were always raised as free-range kids, so I got to leave the house and go anywhere I wanted around Miami, and as long as I, I was home by dinner. So I discovered a little place in Coconut Grove where you could buy fake IDs. And so when we moved to Chapel Hill, and I told my new friends about it, they all wanted me to get them fake IDs when I, the next time I visited Miami. So I brought them all back fake IDs to Chapel Hill, and because we wanted to hang out at the bars with and meet college guys. And so... Um, we were buying beer at the stores and going to frat parties and hanging out at all the local bars in Chapel Hill until my dad found my fake ID. And so because we were free-range kids, um, I didn't really get in trouble. I never really got in trouble for anything, any of the bad things that I did. Like when my dad used to bring home the computer paper for us to draw on and the punch cards for us to draw on, I didn't want to draw on those. I wanted to draw on the walls. And my dad didn't get mad. My parents, I didn't get in trouble for it. They just wanted to know why I did it and what, what did I draw and what was the meaning of this drawing and stuff like that. So that, that, that's how they started incorporating everything that I did or things that I got in trouble for into um, whatever they were doing. So, okay, so my dad was um, teaching the, his class at UNC Chapel Hill and he realized that me being busted for the fake ID was going to be a big opportunity for him to teach his students about um, probability and statistics and to, to yeah. create an investigation. Yeah. And Which so, is so I went undercover. He had me go undercover. <laughs> and, and I had to visit all the stores and all the bars in Chapel Hill to see which ones would accept my fake ID. <laughs> and that was my punishment, but it was also a lot of fun. But, but did you get to buy beer in those bars yep. at least? Yep, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's a good punishment. Yeah, and so yeah. Th that's a picture of me and my friends laughing about me getting in trouble, busted by, busted by my <laughs> dad. And that's a picture of, of my future husband standing behind us wondering what we were laughing about. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Well, uh, uh, so... Uh, we're short on time, and we still want to answer uh, some questions. So I want to, to just show the video of the colleagues, uh, because they sent so many good videos uh, uh, saying nice words about Phil. Let's, let's, let's go for the colleagues' video. It's the, it's the last video. I was the chair of the search committee that hired Phil initially. He became a wonderful colleague, and he and Sue good friends for many years. 
I used to use his wonderful book, Precision Journalism, in my research methods classes. I think the chapter he wrote on sampling was the best that's ever been written. Just perfect. And my students got it and understood it. So, Phil, you have left a major legacy in the field and in my heart. Years ago when I was searching for a PhD program, North Carolina was my long shot. And I didn't expect to get in. They were only accepting four. But I had the inside track and I didn't know why at the time, but I had polling experience from the St. Pete Times and the New York Times Regional Group in Florida. And also my name was Sue. And Phil was on the selection committee and I just don't think he was going to let anyone named Sue get overlooked. But the biggest impact Phil had on my life honestly, was that he introduced me to the vice president for research at Knight Ritter, Jenny Fielder. And um, Jenny and I have been together now for 29 years. Uh, I was Phil's very first doctoral student, and what Phil probably doesn't know about that is that when it was announced he would be joining the faculty of the North Carolina Journalism School, I went to the dean and specifically asked that my graduate student fellowship be reassigned to work for Phil. My personal motto has always been to quote, ask for the job, and I am sure glad that I asked for this one, because learning from Phil opened up my career. Phil's first big project after coming to UNC was for the ASNE about the ethics of reporting. Phil analyzed a large survey among editors, publishers, and reporters which examined differing perspectives on the ethical codes that create public confidence in the profession. And Phil wowed the ASNE with a brilliant analysis based on some detailed and well thought out cross tabulations. And then Phil made the very same data set available to me for my dissertation. And of course, being the know-it-all graduate student, I decided that I would apply a much more sophisticated approach using some stats software that could perform a multivariate analysis of variance. And after two years of wringing the data set dry, I wound up with the very same findings and conclusions that Phil had worked out with a much more straightforward approach to the analysis. And I learned a key lesson. And it is that just about anything meaningful in most data sets can be surfaced without complication. And the beauty in that simplicity is not only the efficiency of time and resources, it is the ability to better engage and reach an audience and to affect real changes in understanding and decisions. That has been Phil's ultimate passion. Democracy, liberty, freedom, government that works for the citizens in a democratic republic. I was a newspaper reporter before I started the PhD program at UNC Chapel Hill in the Journalism and Communications School, as it was then called, where Phil Meyer became my academic advisor. Some suggested that Phil would be a poor match for me because he wouldn't know how to mentor a doctoral student. After all, he had just been a reporter, a correspondent, an editor at some of America's finest daily newspapers and already had written precision journalism. After all, he was just a Neiman Fellow, a Pulitzer Prize team recipient, and the night chair, but he didn't have a doctorate. I ignored the naysayers, believing Phil's real-world experience would make for the best mentorship. What Phil saw, I never imagined. A professional path fusing research skills, analytic perspective, and innovation. Hallmarks of Phil's style that I had inculcated with my own creativity and interest, turning into a 30-year career in market research. I went from thinking qualitatively to quantitatively, and my fear of numbers transformed into a new dimension of seeing the world of problem solving. Phil, thank you for helping me find my way, for being my advisor, for not having a doctorate, for giving us precision journalism, and for being my friend. Phil Myers stopped teaching classes at the University of North Carolina more than a decade ago, but his impact on students here continues to this day. His writing on media economics and data journalism are still required reading for my students. But it isn't just his pioneering work in these fields that's enduring, it's also his curiosity and kindness. 
I first met Phil when he taught my undergraduate media ethics class. I was a pretty poor student, and Phil could have decided that I wasn't worth his time, but he didn't. When I returned to UNC to start my teaching career in 2007, just as Phil was wrapping up his, he set the standard for the kind of professor I wanted to become. Few people connect ideas and connect people like Phil Meyer. Uh, uh... You know, uh, uh, the work of Phil Meyer is one of the things that I could discuss with friends for hours and hours and hours, but unfortunately, our time is, is, has come to an end. Uh, uh, the videos, all the videos I showed here are in lagondata.com.br slash Phil. You can see them all, uh, including the ones we didn't have time to pass. I had to skip them, unfortunately. And, and please, uh, let's applaud Philip Meyer on the 50 years of publication of the book that started all of what made this meeting possible. And uh, Melissa, thank you. Let's, let's wake up. Uh, uh, all the people who, who made questions got something special. And please come to the stage with us. Uh, we can talk uh, at the coffee break there because we have to close the room. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, come here, the two, two to this side, two to that side. And, well, we, we all have bow ties here. Thank you, Phil. And let's applaud Phil for the 50 years of citizen journalism. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with us tonight. Até amanhã, é verdade, até amanhã. E uh, uh, para quem tiver interesse, na, aqui na SPM, a partir da próxima semana, eu e a Eliana Loureiro vamos estar oferecendo um curso de Data Storytelling. Uh, tá, vai estar bem interessante. Muito obrigado e até amanhã. <risos>